Hey, beautiful soul. Welcome to Spirit Speakeasy. I'm Joy Giovanni, joyful medium. I'm a working psychic medium, energy healer, and spiritual gifts mentor. This podcast is like a seat at the table in a secret club, but with mediums, mystics, and the spiritual luminaries of our time. So come behind the velvet ropes with me and see inside my world as I chat insider style with profoundly gifted souls. We go deep, share juicy stories, laugh a lot, and it wouldn't be a speakeasy without great insider secrets and tips. You might even learn that you have some gifts of your own. So step inside the spirit speakeasy. Hey, beautiful soul, welcome to the Spirit Speakeasy. Our guest today is a unique and really creative individual. One of the things I love about her work uh, is that she talks about her approach for what she calls spiritual misfits or spiritual orphans, those who maybe came from a a more religious-based tradition but just don't find themselves fitting into any of those boxes, which when I first heard about the way she talked about her work, that resonated so deeply with me. Um, Her name is Kate Fontana. She identifies as a pagan Christian priestess, um, or sometimes the way she explained it in this episode was a, a pagan priestess with Christian vibes, <laughs> which I thought was really cool. Um, she's a mentor to the spiritual fringe is the way she says it again, which I, I just love. And also um, she's a psychic and healer. So I was really, you know, I've been, I've been trying to coordinate schedules with Kate for quite a bit to get to share her with you. I love her profound perspective on things. She also has the heart of an activist. Um, I just, I'm really just, uh, I tease her about this sometimes. I'm really a little bit fangirl for her work. So I'm really excited to share this conversation with you today between myself and the incredible Kate Fontana. Welcome in everyone to the Spirit Speakeasy. Whether you are a returning listener or a new listener, I'm so happy to have you with us today. I'm really excited to share this guest. I'm going to read her bio so we can jump right into the conversation. We've actually been chatting a little and I was like, I have to press record because I really am excited to share um, her with you. Her name is Kate Fontana. Uh, Kate's a psychic pagan Christian priestess and mentor to the spiritual fringe. Kate knows firsthand how it feels to be overwhelmed, stuck, powerless, or burnout or about to be in the face of relentless troubles of our time. She understands how many people are longing to feel nourished and grounded and joyful in their bodies and in their life. She believes that deep engagement in service to our world and living well in our bodies do not have to be incompatible. Through her unique earth and body-based offerings, she helps spiritual misfits connect in down-to-earth ways to their innate resilient center and nurture reluctant, unconventional leaders on their sacred path. Kate is also the founder and director of The Sanctuary Northwest, a center for resilience and culture. She has a background in liberative theology, clinical spiritual care, trauma-informed yoga, inner spiritual contemplative practice, activism, and somatics. She loves karaoke, whales, and being an auntie. She lives on the ancestral land of the Coast Salish people in Tacoma, Washington with her sweetie Coda and their zoo of animals. Um, And make sure you check the show notes because Kate's got a lot of contact points that I'm going to share with you. Uh, Welcome, Kate Fontana. I'm so happy to have you. you. Yeah, thank you. So honored to be here. I have to tell you, one of the things um, when we first met that I was most drawn to about your work is the idea of spiritual misfits. Mm. Um, Because I feel like that so deeply resonates with so many of us who maybe don't feel like we fit into any traditional box of a religion or belief system, I would love for you to just dive in and talk more about that. Yeah. Yeah. It took me a little bit to like kind of land on that phrase, but it, even as you, you're saying it back to me, I think it, it really, it really is, uh, like how I would self-identify. Yeah. Um, and I've met so many people on, on my own journey who have, um, are kind of like collectors, you know, of um, practices and um, experiences, um, and who 
where our experiences don't necessarily fit into one specific, um, yeah, tradition or um, lineage. And I guess what I can share just from my, my own journey. So I was raised Roman Catholic and there's a lot of ways that I still feel Catholic. I mean, many Catholics will say, um, it's in your DNA. Like you, you never <laughs> stop being Catholic. Um, and, and yet there, you know, especially in the last, you know, 50 years, but then, uh, especially in the last like 10, there's been a mass exodus or reckoning, you know, with, for yeah. many folks in, in, um, Catholicism. And I really, um, wrestled for like a lot of my adolescence and into my early twenties with ha having so much love and like longing to be, a, um, to, to belong to that community and, and then needing to come to terms with like being a woman uh, being a queer person and how I could exist in a whole way um, yeah. and where I could exist in a whole way. And over time, what the only thing I've really settled on in that is like, that has to occur in me. Like that intersection, all of us are like a, an intersection of infinite experiences that's never going to be totally represented or um you know like we're the one place where all of that lives and so it, yeah. it takes time to it's taken me time to develop like a sense of wholeness in myself that allows me to kind of travel into different scenarios and environments and still experience that wholeness um and not like demand that everything change for my comfort um, even though I think there are th some things that are worth advocating for a change. Um, but yeah, so I think that that experience of being a misfit has, has been um, one of kind of negotiating a sense, that sense of identity and belonging and the tension um, amidst those and um yeah. And becoming comfortable with, I mean, I, I imagine all of us actually are more misfit, right. Then. Yeah. <laughs> then well, um, yeah. And then, I love what you are, sorry, not to jump on you, but yeah, I love what ahead, you were saying about in. being a, a collector of experiences and things that resonate with us. And it could be as simple as a quote that we hang on to that's from a different faith base or, a, a, you know, someone outside of our cultural sphere, um, I think that's such a profound way to look at it and so true because I don't think, like you were saying, we, we all are an individual, unique collection of all of the things, right? The circumstances, beliefs, schools we went to, people we knew and didn't know. Uh, and it's, it's so profound that you're now trying to hold a space so people can be completely individual but still part of a community. Um, the other thing, as to being a collector, you have quite a unique collection of modalities that you practice as well. Would you mind sharing a little bit about your journey of how 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 the breadcrumbs? I kind of feel like mine yeah, are breadcrumbs, and I know you've totally. said that too. Like, yeah, really how'd you find that. your breadcrumbs, girl? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it was a dark forest. <laughs> oh, it okay. feels like a dark forest yeah. sometimes. Yeah, totally. Um, well, I I do think the the first sort of trail was as I was describing, like coming to terms with um, being in, in this institution, in this religious tradition um, that just didn't, in my opinion, didn't recognize my whole humanity. Yeah. Um, and, and ways that I have also in, internalized that. Um, so I think, I had to, I started with kind of my own wrestling. I've uh, really struggled with depression since being an early teenager. And, um, and I guess just kind of followed my pain in that way, yeah. which I imagine is true for many folks. Like um, what there's some phrase or whatever, like 
you it, that like hit, hit, I don't I don't know like um, we don't change until what is is more painful than the change itself. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I think my own pain. I I'm a functional overachiever, you know, which is a, a way that my um, I guess like my neurosis manifests in a socially acceptable way. <laughs> so I, I always looked very successful on the outside. Um, I was involved in all the things, very academic, uh, got great grades, um, did a lot of community service projects and organizing. And by the time I was like 21 or 22, I just, everything looked great on the outside and on the inside. I felt totally empty. And on top of the emptiness, I had a lot of shame about that because I didn't, I couldn't understand why I would feel this way. I didn't, I didn't feel like I had earned that kind of like pain. Oh, that's interesting. Um, You know, like, and so then I did like 10 years of therapy. <laughs> and, Good for you. Great. And it turns out we all have pain, you know, and um, it's not relative. Like there's not like a competition of, you know, who's is worse in order yeah. for us to like um, be able like re- be able to um, really own and appreciate like those troubles. Um, and so it really was like kind of pulling through that, that, um, I sought help, you know, and I would say yoga, the yoga tradition and particularly like the goddess lineage in the yoga tradition was the first place that I experienced like kind of a recognition of myself in the divine. And I like that. Yeah. And I had never, I'd never like, I've never felt like ag- even really agnostic or, but I also had never felt like a personal connection with the sacred. Um, and I was also completely dissociated from my body, my physical body. And, um, you know, we can get into a lot of the reasons why that happens in like Western Christianity. But for me, like yoga was kind of the entry point back into my body and back into an experience of the divine that felt relatable as like, as a woman, as a embodied person. Yeah. Um, and then from there, so I, I swam in a lot of like Eastern contemplative practice for many years. Um, taught yoga, ran a yoga studio, uh, started a meditation practice. Um, and I had a lot of peers and even in my own therapeutic work, um, started exploring trauma and uh, how that impacts, you know, our experience of being in bodies. Um, so I taught trauma informed yoga for many years. And then this is the part that like, I don't know, things, things got weird, but, um, <laughs> but this, I know you're psychic. So all of this, is no, this won't be weird, weird anyway. for us. So yeah, we're right. about it. Um, I had, I guess what I would call now, like a mystical encounter with Jesus. And this was, um, about six or seven years ago. And what I felt was, like a presence of a very tactile presence of unconditional love that for me was familiar by the name Jesus. And to be clear again, like I had never, that was never a part that I'd been into in Mm -hmm. my Christian heritage, like the Jesus people. I did not, you know, I was like, yeah, he's a great teacher model. Yeah. Uh, Maybe did some cool things, but I didn't get the whole like, Jesus is your best friend, like Lord and Savior thing. That was not. That I think that's important isn't... to mention, just because yeah. for so many people, it is kind of the focus, and so, it, yeah. I mean, it even adds an extra layer to your experience, just because it wasn't necessarily part of your practice all along. Right, it wasn't, and at and when I had this experience, it was what kind of clicked for me was like, oh, Jesus is an energy field, 
like Jesus is an energetic presence that exists in the cosmos. Um, and we're all like, I think they go by many names perhaps yeah. in different traditions. Um, but for my lineage, the image and the kind of felt sense was like, okay, Jesus. And I also really experienced them as, as a specific, I use them, but like they did feel very masculine, which mm-hmm. was odd for me because I'd been so immersed in like the feminine divine of, of yoga and the goddess world. And, uh, I mostly work with women, female bodied folks. And, um, and I felt this just like deeply gentle and supportive holding presence, um, And I was like, okay, I can get behind a Jesus like that, you know, like, um, and so that really drew me back into my tradition of origin. And around that time, I encountered um, a woman who told me about this movement called the Roman Catholic Women Priests. And when she told me about them and like said that she was one of these women priests, my jaw dropped and I burst into tears. Wow. <laughs> and, and then I like hid. We were on retreat and I like <laughs> did not talk to her for two days. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, it's the last day. I should probably go talk to this woman again, find out what's what. And um, I learned about this movement and it really felt like, so she gave me the card of a, a somewhat local woman priest um, who lives in kind of the town over from me. And I called her and I was like, okay, just so you know, this is not me <laughs> saying I'm, I want to be what you are. I just need to know more information. Yeah, that's funny. And so then over about five years, I just kind of, those were the breadcrumbs. I was like, I don't know where this is going to wind up, but I, there was an energy. There was like a, a pull that, Later, I'd be able to identify, or at least I name it as like eros, like the the pull of desire, yeah, um, the pull of spirit in that real kind of womb place. And I just had to keep going with that. It did not make sense for like my practical life, but it absolutely made sense for where I had been coming from. And like a lot of pieces felt like they fell into place. Um, and this movement, because this movement is ordaining women and queer folks, actually folks of all genders, and um, they've been officially excommunicated from the Catholic Church, but the movement continues to claim lineage and to petition for re-inclusion. Um, so I was involved with them for several years. I went to seminary, um, got my academia nerd on. So like <laughs> that is one modality I love. Yeah. Like the intellectual um, exploration. I love reading and studying texts. And um, and at also at that time, I mean, part of what sort of launched that was like another like crisis <laughs> um, because I lost my job. I was running this yoga studio and I um, made a financial error that was devastating for the studio and um, was transitioned out of my leadership role. And it really rocked my world at the time. It really rocked my, I realized how much of my identity was tied up in that, um, the community I'd been involved in and the work I was doing. And it was also like, you know, the cosmic two by four or whatever, like, okay, we told you about this thing. So get a move on. Um, And so I went to seminary. I also, um, that was when I started psychic school. And that was also when I started um, training in, uh, um, at the time it was called cultural somatics, but a a modality around um, body-based integration of activism and like culture building. Um, So, I didn't, wasn't really aware, like at the time they felt kind of disparate, like I was doing this academic thing and then I was in psychic school and doing somatics and 
now I've, I've been seeing how they've kind of braided together, Mm -hmm. you know, and, um, and in the last two years, I've been kind of examining that braid and being like, okay, what do I do? (laughs) (laughs) What am I doing with this? What am I given all of these things I've been threading together? And, um, well, and it is so fascinating because to to look at it just on paper, those things do seem or sound or feel like very separate modalities. Um, it's interesting that you use that analogy because that's how I feel it too, is the braiding together of all the pieces of me to make whatever this body of work is, right? Yeah. I feel like you said so many important things just in that, I know, that was a lot. part that we were talking about. No, I love it though, because one thing I want to touch on is it was huge in the beginning of my work. I didn't really realize in my initial training that I wasn't fully in my body. Um, I think a lot of us, especially early on, don't even know what that means. I, I remember being like, I don't, what do you mean? Where do I feel in my body? It's not my body. Like, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. And I feel like we know now that often that is a reaction response to trauma. Mm -hmm. Um, But I would love for you to talk a little bit more about that because I do feel like a lot of people, I mean, some people, I'll just say it that way, the the human inclination is to want to go straight for those mystical experiences. And while sometimes they happen spontaneously, often what I've seen, you know, just from observation with other practitioners that I know is it does typically tend to be after some form of therapy, emotional processing, healing, moving back into our body so that we can create the space for those mystical experiences. And while yes. like usually the way I say it is like, it's not the sexy work, it's like the hard work, but Absolutely. it is the through way. So I, I would love to hear more about that. Yeah. Yes. I mean, the way there's, I think there's a lot of different places I could go with that, but the way that I imagine it for me is like yeah we really strive or kind of um, maybe idealize the the spiritual path from the little glimpses from the mountaintop um you know from the like ecstatic um pinnacle peak experiences and that is such a small fraction of life, yeah. <laughs> you know, yes. uh, and, and especially a, a, a spiritual life. I do, th- I do think those are often catalysts. Um, at least they have been for me. And especially with that period with, um, encountering Jesus, like I went through about a six week period where I truly felt myself in an altered state. Like I, it felt like glowing golden light <laughs> was like it. emanating from me, you know, and like I, I felt like this cheesy kindergarten teacher or whatever, like, I've got that joy, 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 joy down in my heart, you know. And <laughs> um and it, but even even while I was in it, I I remember something that was very important for me was this sort of knowing like, okay, I'm getting a glimpse of something, but it's not gonna last. Yeah. Um but it's still real and it's still touching on something that's real and it's okay. I remember having part of the grace of that time that did not feel like, like I had, I was doing it. It was more this gift of knowing and of having this real open handedness, like, okay, this isn't going to last forever. Can I just drink it in while it's here? And then I remember seeing it fade after about six weeks and life got really normal again, you know, and, and even since then, I, I've still had periods of deep depression. I just this last winter, I had one that I was like, okay, I guess this is the, I guess this is as (laughs) like, I guess this is what's most real. I guess this is who I am. You know, we still go to the highs and the lows. Um, But there's a lot of time of life that's in between that's just like, you know, the, what is it, chop wood, carry water. Yes, for Um, sure. And that's actually more of what my work is now um, as I'm working with people. It's a lot more about um, what we're doing in the daily little ways that, uh, that make room for the integration 
of experiences of those that experiences like those that come because we're human like they will come you know like and some people are good at facilitating those higher intensity experiences um and those those can be really transformative and if they don't have a place to land in life and in our bodies um we get sick we burn out um we we have psychotic breaks yeah (laughs) there's a lot of um risk i guess in those peak experiences you know like the electric lightning bolt uh that doesn't have a grounding cord starts a fire and so much sense right so yeah i think that's been a lot of my own um growth and ways that i try to support people um in very simple you know a lot of the somatic foundations are what might look like very boring you know things like i'll have per- a person hold a thing and be like oh is this heavy or light is it cold or warm um is it soft or rough and so when you when people are like i don't even know what it means to get in my body like yeah. that's where we begin and it's and then they're like well that is not sexy right it's not yeah <laughs> like you said it's not sexy or um you know even the first psychic um practice like in my psychic training it was a year long and the bulk of it is self energy management yeah. it's not and there is a lot of like profound stuff that comes through that but um the real it it's a it's a it's a daily tending to i mean you'll you'll know this too yeah. like a daily tending to our own energy field and own energy hygiene that's like brushing your teeth making your bed you know yeah. cleaning out the cobwebs of our inner world so my first mentor used to call it changing your spiritual underwear Yes. <laughs> Which I always thought was very funny. But it is. I mean, and it is one of the things I love so much about your work is, like you said, we, in our human experience, we do have these peaks and valleys, you know, whether they're spiritual or just human life. We have great successes that we feel very on top and things that happen in life that just take us to the lowest of our lows. And, but most of life is spent in this in between time. And you have this beautiful, um, set of practices. I'm sure many, many practices in the toolbox that you teach that are um, for that in-between time, right? Practices and some of it personal ritual and energy management and things to uh, move us through the day-to-day, I guess, maybe in a more um, intentional way. How would you describe it? Like what are the, what are the practices providing? Yeah, I think well, I would describe it as like little touch points to um, a sense of connection to life. Um, and one one way I've been thinking about it, actually since um, I did some traveling last year to Ireland and the British Isles, and we had a guide take us to Stonehenge. This is maybe a roundabout way to say what I want to say, but, and he, 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 it was just me and my partner. So it was like a very like personal experience. And he guided us around a different route. um, So not where all the tourists go in, but kind of up this other way. And his instruction was like, you know, just sort of tune in to where it feels like the land wants you to go. And where the stones want your attention, um, where they want you to pause. And the way he described it, it really started to feel like, stay with me for a second. It felt like acupuncture for the land. Interesting. Like these little pinpoints of attention that the land was asking for to, to create a little thread of release or opening in that wider ecology and and that's how I think about 
those daily touch points. Like, you know, when you haven't had a good cry in a while, yeah. right? And, and there's just this buildup or like when you, when you're carrying on to resentments, like that person, you just have the list going on and it builds up and then it has to get out and it's probably going to get out in like the fight. I just had one of these recently where it's like <laughs> something sparked it, but then all the little backlog yeah. of things came out. And, um, if we're doing a little smaller doses of tending, then the backlog maybe doesn't have quite so much time to accumulate. Um, so for me, that'll look like, like before I, when I get up in the morning, I just drink my lemon water and try to take some conscious breaths with that. Um, I'll go and stand on the grass and like imagine my root down into the earth. And um, I try to pause a, a couple times a day, maybe a light a candle. Some people are very sensory. So smelling something. Um, while cooking is, can often be a really beautiful moment to just sort of distribute the accumulation of like the daily dust or whatever. Yeah. Um, so well, and I anyway, like the way you talk about that as more mind. like intentional tending along the way, just like you would, I, I use the analogy of a garden a lot in this work and this relationship with ourself and our own soul and our energy that it seems like what you're saying is if we just kind of weed a little bit and prune a little bit along the way, then we don't get this um, you know, overgrown mess that has to, to then be yeah. professionally. You know, totally. <laughs> we need like a lot of help with. Yeah. The other one thing that comes to mind as I've explored more of my Celtic and Irish ancestry, um, it, in many, many families, there's a prayer for everything. And this mm. is true in a lot more earth-based traditions worldwide. Like there's a, there's a prayer for everything. And you know, in the morning, often it was the mother or grandmother would, um, like wake up the house, you know, like yeah. stoke the embers from the night before, say a prayer to wake up the fire again. Um, and you know, in the evening, often a husband or, or father or grandfather would walk the perimeter of the home or, and the land and like, say, say the blessing, the, you know, the protection prayer and, and then there's something at midday. Actually, in Ireland, still, they play on public radio. They play the Angelus. They ring bells, and it's the time for praying this particular prayer at noontime. Wow. And, yeah, I mean, and they're still, like, overlay very Catholic, but not too far under the surface, very pagan. <laughs> That's always been so fascinating to me, how yeah. those two are so enmeshed. Um, yeah, <laughs> have several hours of conversation totally. about that. But. Yeah. And there is something, I, for me anyway, and I think for a lot of people, there is something comforting in certain rituals or certain prayers or certain, um, I, I think it's why as adults, sometimes we crave those things that we experienced comfort in as kids. And a lot of them are rituals like you're talking about, which yeah. is a beautiful thing to return to. Yeah. Kids really do. They'll, they'll take to the rituals more more than adults sometimes be often because like if 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 we have sort of baggage with a religious tradition and I have a lot of folks who work with me who were raised Christian um maybe consider themselves recovering Christians and at first there's a lot of hesitancy I kind of have to warm people up to like singing again or okay. praying aloud yeah. like I, I had I offered like prayer I, I said like would you like to pray to a client recently and they just sort of laughed in my face like no it's become I, a we, very uncomfortable we can't do word that. yeah <laughs> yeah for and sure. so I just said like okay just think about imagine the possibility we do a lot of approach work around those things that I think were really beautiful parts of the ex of many religious traditions and expressions and and I think our aren't don't just belong to those institutions that yeah. they're part of our like I think of prayer as part of our innate language of connection to the rest of the world um, and to life and to spirit. So yeah, those are the things I really like to to do with folks. I love it. I have kind of a hard question um, yeah. for you. 
I'm wondering kind of how we were talking about that religion can be difficult in a lot of aspects, or at least the version of it that we most commonly experience today, <laughs> which I think for my own learning has been, was very different than maybe what it was in its primary origins. But as someone who identifies as a woman, identifies as queer, wants to hold this priestesshood, what makes you want to continue to pursue it from the Catholic parenthood that has excommunicated you rather than just shifting to something else? I have, I have some personal feelings about this. So I'm yeah. so curious to, to hear your thoughts and feelings. Yeah, that's a good question. And I mean, I have totally wrestled with that. And, and actually some things have changed. So I'll share those two. Um, but the I didn't first tell you I was going to ask you this. I hope it's okay. No, no, <laughs> just, no. This is a great Just been question. thinking over here. <laughs> it's, it's really good. And it's one I consider, like I contemplate a lot. And I, I have been asked a lot, like, why don't you just be an Episcopal priest or like something why else? You, yeah. Why anything don't you just else. be something else? And I, I, I have said like, I wish I felt called to that. Like yeah. it would make my life so much easier or I wish I could just let it go. Um, and one of the things that's really actually helped me with this came out of the cultural somatics work was l uh, exploring my relationship with that tradition from the lens of attachment mm -hmm. um, and attachment theory. And that like, you know, we have attachment relationships with, all sorts of things, not just our primary caregiver. And I could see how I had a real anxious avoidant attachment with yeah. this institution. Like I couldn't come near, but I also couldn't let it go. I mean, it's kind of intrinsically set up that way a little bit. Yes. Yes. So that helped me actually kind of work on the attachment relationship. And, um, and then in the last, like, year or so I I've been working I was working with my mentor in that uh in the Roman Catholic women priests and something was just not clicking for me and I couldn't feel the pull and all the steps were sort of laid out in front of me and I just wasn't taking them um like once you're considered a candidate you could be a deacon in six months you could be ordained within two years and and I had done all that upfront work and then I just got to this place where I was like I just wasn't moving forward um and it took many more months to feel out um this fear to kind of let the fear come forward of really a fear of this, I mean, this isn't even my theology consciously, but I remember this very vivid image of, um, like it looked, it was my version of heaven, I guess, which was, it kind of looked like an inn and you could see the lights in the window. And I was like out in the gutter in the darkness. Wow. And it, it was this very primal fear of being cast out, you know, yeah. being like, um, not being able to enter the gates or whatever. And um, again, like it's not even what I believe happens, but there's a deep part of me that did believe that. And that even being a part of this fringe movement was still enough like connection to that, that I was like, okay, but I'm still in here. Right. And, but, and so I, I felt deeply afraid of like, choosing my own exile. Yeah. Um, and, and then the other part that came up was I felt I didn't really, I felt like I needed external validation. I thought I needed someone else to name me. Um, to like deem you worthy of this yeah, priestesshood. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like give me the title. And, and give me permission to like use, use these tools of the lineage. Um, and I meditated on this, you know, I, I did my own sort of psychic work on this and the image or the message that I got from my guides was like, no one can, no one names you a priestess, but yeah. those who come to you as that and for that. And 
I both felt this like deep relief and a deep sadness, like yeah. kind of getting that message um, where it was. And that was kind of my turning point where I was like, okay, I guess I'm, I, I guess this isn't where I need to be. Um, and because I've always been, my work has been so um, earth-based and felt, felt kind of even older or like I was, I'm, I guess, who knows, but I always felt I was touching into something older or more basic. Yeah, maybe, maybe not older, but just like more basic than any of the particular prescribed traditions within the church. Um, I've, a lot of the practice is just like listening to the land and what does the land want? And I do think that's where a lot of, all of our religious rituals have come from, you know, like, yeah. what do we have? Wine. <laughs> what do we, <laughs> well, we have a river. Let's do something there. You know, yeah. like, I think it really has come from these very located um, relationships with the elements of the land. And, and that's what I want to lead people in. Um, and that really feels more of my, my calling. So I actually did leave the um, like the candidacy for official ordination in the Roman Catholic women priests movement about a year ago. Um, and it felt scary. It felt like I was like letting go of my last course, institutional yeah. <laughs> support. Um, and I turned my attention to really just like building my kind of local community and I you know I've been calling myself a Christian pagan priestess still or I'll say sometimes pagan with Christian vibes because I like that. in large part because that is still my lineage yeah um and you know it it has felt to me kind of like the ways I've tried to reckon with being a white person it doesn't work to just decide not to be a white person <laughs> like well, you make a good point <laughs> <laughs> I mean for me this is just for me so like it's still part of my lineage so right. what does it mean to uh, be an ancestor of that lineage in a good way for me like being ancestor and uh, being a descendant of um mostly you know catholic christian not white at the time, but people who would become white in this country, um, you know, settlers, immigrants. And so I do still hold on to that identity um, or that label, I guess, um, in part because I want to be responsible with that lineage uh, and, and connected to that lineage for um, the healing that I want to uh, be a part of yeah. through it and the beautiful pieces that that still feel nourishing to me like I don't know I can't really explain it but like the Eucharist feels nourishing to me like I have a little tattoo about it oh I love it, it. feels like spiritual nourishment and um you know like the liturgical gear I love that uh it all is very earth-based and pagan to me still yeah um, I have to tell you anytime I hear about your work th just the feeling of the energy to me feels like it's tapping into something very ancient very um I, I wouldn't identify it as simple I would identify it more as like original like mm. from before mm -hmm. you know the, the the ceremonial things like you said the waking up of the family the the processes within the home the the way the food is infused with love and care and nurtured over whatever period of time it originally took to make. It's, you know, mm -hmm. we don't necessarily have to do it that way anymore, but mm -hmm. even just pausing to have intention for me feels like tapping into those very um, deep, intuitive things that are, I feel original to all of us. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a really beautiful way of, of understanding why you still feel connected into all of that. Mm -hmm. Is yeah. this what leads to the development and birth of Sanctuary Northwest? Yeah. Um, yeah. Let me share a little bit about those things. So right now my work is a little bit um, not split, but I have 
kind of two elements that I've been nurturing. Um, so the Sanctuary Northwest is a center for resilience and culture. Um, and originally we were focusing around trauma resilience. Um, and I do work with a lot of um, trauma survivors for one-on-one -on -one somatic resilience work. Um, but around that has really formed this culture element where I get to be priestess for my community, which is really lovely. Um, we do seasonal celebrations. We just celebrated Beltane a few days ago and had a um, beautiful kind of flower ritual. And, um, and the intention around that is, is to nurture more healthy culture that eliminates or mitigates the um you know the causes of trauma in cultures in communities and in individuals um so we do work to reconnect to the land to body to ancestry in a culturally respectful way um a lot of the folks i work with are um as I said, like often former Christians or former church goers, um, people who, you know, miss, who don't miss church, but miss the rituals and community. Yeah. Um, a lot of white folks who are, you know, maybe coming out of the activist world um, or have done anti-racism work, but still kind of often what gets replicated in those um, circles are a lot of the sort of dominant norms of whiteness culture. And those, those take a little more time to unwind, like yeah. in, in our bodies and psyches. And so I work with a lot of folks around that. Um, and then my other sort of project that's forming is that I'm very, ex what do they say? Scared sighted about is <laughs> I haven't heard that before. Like <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's, it's called Priestess School, and I do not have a launch date for that yet, but uh, my dream for that is really to offer the thing that I didn't have. Yeah. Um, and to that's the part of like nurture reluctant, unconventional leaders um, on their sacred path. And for many people, this won't necessarily look like, you know, hosting big events. Um, I have a, a good handful of clients who are moms who want to be the priestess of their home yeah. in a more supported, um, in a more supported way and kind of be the su support a spiritual foundation for their children and families um, with the outside of kind of traditional faith, faith groups. So I'm very excited about that. Um, yeah. And nervous. I, I, I guess we never feel ready <laughs> for like the big thing that's going to come know. through us. Um, I but. was just telling it to someone just last week that in this work anyway, the way I always feel is the way I thought it was going to be was, you know, you get this inspiration and then the elements line up and then that step appears on the staircase and then you graciously step onto the step. That is not, <laughs> it is not proven to be true for me. Like, oh, me? You mean, oh, of yeah, course. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, no, 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 not me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but that's the way it seems to work for me is like I, some sort of growth happens in my work personally and, you know, publicly and I feel excited about something new or like you were saying that that gut or womb pull to express in a new way and then I have to start stepping for that step before any of the elements have appeared and just through my you know intention and personal work and action in the world trust or know or that that step either will then appear or I'll be directed in a different direction. Mm -hmm. So that's what, what for me always feels the scariest, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the thing that I've had to, I still have to, I still have to relearn basically every time it happens. This came from one of my first yoga teachers um, in the tantric tradition. The dance of the goddess in the world is described as this, the word is spanda and it's 
the expansion and contraction, wow. which is a, a movement that we see through all natural processes, right? Yeah. Like the breath is probably the most uh, accessible, but for some reason, as she was describing it, she was making this motion, like her arms went out and then she like curled in, you know, kind of arms came in kind of the cat pose. And it just clicked for me, like the things that I've always, basically the places in life that I don't want to be, yeah. <laughs> those are contractions that are yeah. just part of the dance. Like, the valleys, right? The, you can't have exactly. the peaks all the time. Yeah. And I, I was going to mention this when we were talking about that earlier, like, we think that's not the spiritual part. Yeah. You know, we think that's the absence um, or when I'm not, you know, being connected to whatever. But it it's there all the time. Like actually the pulsation is the, the, the dance, is the dance. And so I, I keep having to remind myself when I'm in the contraction, it just means we we about to expand girl like <laughs> yes that's and so then valid similarly like when i get a big expansion i'll not i try not to like set myself up but i i try to remind myself like okay this is temporary too i'm probably going to crash a little after this um and part of the skill set i think in those daily tendings is being able to ride the expansion and contraction in a more more skillful way ideally or like a less sort of ping pong way yeah Yeah. Um, or even just having the acknowledgement or the awareness that all the parts of us are present during all of those times yes you know yes Mm -hmm. yeah (sighs) that we're no less in those valleys or contractions We're, we're no less the full embodiment of our spiritual selves you know than we are at the very peaks of it. Wow. It's a really profound idea. I love that. And I love that idea of the breath because it is something that I think we all have a reference point for, you know, Mm -hmm. that's so beautiful. Um, Besides the priestess school, which I am super excited to hear more about as it develops and would love to have you back on when it's in its full, Mm, full and ready uh, flagship. Um, You also are getting ready to launch a podcast that I'm really excited to hear a little bit more about just because I don't know much about it yet. Yeah, that's great. I was doing some editing for it just before this. Um, So the podcast is called Priestess of Ordinary Things, which I was... um, you know, even just given what we talked about, I I hope makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> totally. What we're talking about and um, what what the podcast is oriented towards is to um, support people of all genders. I know priestess is a, a feminized or feminine word, but um, I think I guess I kind of use it just as a counter to the hyper masculine. Yeah, you know, um, but. For folks of all genders tasked with the um, sacred purpose of tending the sacred of daily life and how to live during these turbulent, what to, to me seem like tur- turbulent times and and on the edge of cultural collapse on yeah. a lot of dimensions, um, how do we live through these well enough Um Margaret Wheatley is this author who writes about having an island of sanity amidst the chaos. And that, that just, that image has been so vivid for me. Like, how do we gather, even though the ship may be going down, like, can, can we live in a good enough way um, that stays connected to our wholeness, to our sacredness, um, to the web of life that is still nurturing us, you know, that we're still a part of even through the contraction that we're going through. Um, So, yeah, I mean, I'm hoping to cover as, as was described, I have lots of interests. So um, (laughs) we'll talk about practical spirituality. Like I try to keep things pretty down to earth, even though I also love ideation and kind of the intellectual side. Um, eroticism, Christianity, uh, seasonal living, um, and kind of whatever other topics are my, my guests want to bring. So I'll be excited to have more of those conversations. And it's, I really, for me, I mean, I've been a, a 
listener and fan of some podcasts for much longer than I've had this one. And I think it's just as a listener, it's so nice to have something like that to be able to, I don't know, flow into almost and get some understanding and maybe learn some variations of some practices or try some new practices. And it almost reminds me of like going to the hat store and like you just get to try on bits of things or meet new people and through, you know, whoever you're going to have as guests is just what I love about this because it's, you know, people might, that might not have crossed paths either, you know, different ways. And it's, I do think it's such a, it's going to be such an exciting journey for, you know, you and for the listeners. So I'm excited for the launch of that. Do we have a, a hard and fast launch date yet? I am aiming for May 31st. Oh, that's very soon. Now that that's in recording, (laughs) I guess I'm going to do it. (laughs) Well, everyone can tune in with your social media points and get on your email list so that they can just be in advance notice of of, uh, all the dates and everything that's coming up. Actually, there's one more thing I want to touch on before we jump into what I like to call the spirit speed round. Um, you have a really cool free gift available right now. I would love for you to talk a little bit about that. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, so my free gift is called Earth Magic, Three Simple Celebrations of Spiritual Nourishment. And you can get that on my website, katefontana.com. Um, it's a series of videos that really illustrates what it's like to work with me and also shares some of the um, kind of foundational practices, um, simple rituals, uh, simple meditation practices and visualizations that, yeah, just as we were describing through the podcast, really form um, the foundation of these simple tendings to the sacred in our, in our daily life and uh, in our own homes. So um, yeah, I'd love for folks to go grab that if you'd like. And yeah, it sounds like the coolest like starter kit to me. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny as I was putting it together, I was like, Oh, I guess this is what I do with basically every client. Like yeah. basically every group I run, we do these things. That's so, so great. It is the starter kit. Well, and it's such a nice way, like you said, for people to get an understanding of what it, you know, what it's like to work with you, the, your way of explaining things. Cause all teachers communicate differently. And so it's mm-hmm. a, a nice point of entry to your work. And of course, I'll link that in the show notes. So don't feel like you have to, I mean, katefontana.com is pretty easy to remember, but (laughs) if you're driving or can't remember, you could just visit the show notes of wherever you're the listening or viewing to this. And I'll have all of the contact points there. Um, I actually was reading on your website about that. And I was like, I want to get get this free (laughs) offer. I'm very excited. Yeah. Yeah. I want to see what it is. Um, Okay. So we do this at the end of our guest episodes. Uh, it is called the Spirit Speed Round. It's four questions. They're not hard, but um, they produce interesting answers. So I'm excited awesome. to, to share them with you. Um, okay. The first question is, share one thing that really shocked you or was unexpected about your spiritual gifts as you came to understand them. Oh, okay. The thing that comes to mind is that um, that my spiritual gifts were things that I did all the time that I didn't realize was my spiritual gift. You know what I mean? Yes. So, so it's like the, the, the normal thing, <laughs> it's just like part of your, your normal existence, but it took having a teacher, it took having some outside in, input to be like, no, not everyone does that. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, like one of mine was, not all the time, but often I can, I'll know what song's going to come on the radio next. Oh, that's cool. I'll, I'll just start having, we'll already start th- singing it. And clear audience, so like clear hearing is one of my gifts. So that's kind of, that was one of the cues um, or like getting an earworm. I'd, I'd sing a song all the time, uh, just be stuck in my head for a while. And then what I learned was, okay, to just ask like, what's the message? Why is that song coming? Like, that's the way that my guides communicate. So that was surprising and, and really enlivening to me to learn, like, whatever your gift is, you're probably already doing it. You I just love don't that. know that everyone else doesn't do that. It's so true. And it's funny because I describe this more with like, um, being able to see people's auras and color, color inside my eyes. And, um, I, I have a good amount of clear audience, but I've 
I would say clairvoyance is probably the strongest for me naturally. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because when I explain it to people, like, no, I just always had it, but I didn't know it was weird. Like, yes. <laughs> we, don't, we don't ask people like, oh, do you also know what song's coming next? We just yes. think like, <laughs> oh, no, most people just kind of must guess, you know. Uh-huh. Um, I love that. That's a great answer. Okay. I got it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the next question. Okay. Speed. Um, yeah, Speedy. Uh, if you could spend a day in the spirit world, you got the full tour, you got to spend time with everyone you've ever known who's crossed over, it's mm-hmm. almost time for you to return to your life and your guide tells you you have one hour left and you can spend it with anyone who's on the other side that you would like. Who do you choose and why? Mm-hmm. Yeah, my immediate sense is with my grandmother, my paternal grandmother, um, Evelyn Trahan Fontana. And it's funny, as you were saying it, I was like, okay, I know who, I know all the people I would tour around to see, um, you know, St. John of the Cross and probably Jesus. Yeah. Okay. Um, Like famous people or whatever, but the, my grandmother died probably, I was in college, I think. Um, And when I knew her, she she was not very well um, in her final years. She was, uh, she aged kind of a little somewhat prematurely. And my grandfather had died years before I was young. Um, And I don't, I don't know this for sure, but my sense is kind of the life went out when my grandfather died. And, um, and my grandmother had pretty extreme mental health challenges. She was manic depressive, bipolar. She spent time in institutions. Um, she also had seven boys. Wow. <laughs> I don't know if that contributes, but, <laughs> um, but I, I, again, so I didn't know her that well. Um, she was always a little scary, honestly. Um, just, just very, a little bit, um, kind of sassy Cajun woman and didn't, didn't really take shit from people. And, um, but I, I would want to, I feel a lot of, um, relatedness to her through having my own mental health struggles and, um, and just want to know what that was like. I want to know what that was like for her. And, I've felt her presence um, through a couple of periods of my hard times. And um, I just, I guess I just want to know that how, that she's okay on the other side, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and then what that was like for her and what, what she would have needed or wanted differently and kind of, what her sense is of our like ancestral experience of that. Cause there's, there's additional like mental health struggles throughout my, particularly the women of that side of my family. And yeah, I just want to know, like from the matriarch. (laughs) Yeah. What a, what a beautiful idea. I'm so sorry for your loss too. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. Even though we have spiritual gifts, we have very human lives as we've chatted. About. Mm-hmm. What's one quirky thing about you that people might be surprised to learn? Oh, I guess <laughs> the, the confessional that comes to mind is, um, like I, I'm, I'm very irritable when my house isn't how I want it to be (laughs) and my partner will attest to this like we have as you said in my bio we have a little zoo of animals I'm more of like the animal step parent and actually maybe this is more specifically the thing I feel like a very bad like Pacific Northwest lesbian (laughs) for this but I'm not really an animal person like I love the idea of animals and yeah. appreciate that people have them, but I've never really gotten the bond that oh, people have so with their animals. And so like, if there's, so I have instituted daily vacuuming that sometimes happens, sometimes doesn't, but like the fur situation. I can understand that. I, I get very crabby about that. Well, I so. think that's legitimate. Thank <laughs> that's you. That's my two cents. But, <laughs> Thank you. But yeah, we probably wouldn't expect that about you. <laughs> 
You don't lose any cards or anything. You still carry all your cards. Yeah, I have an irritable streak. (laughs) Um, leave us with one pearl of wisdom. What's one piece of advice you wish that you'd had early on in your understanding of your gifts or your journey? Okay. This is coming. Okay. I'm just going to share the thing that came up, which is like, um, I guess is in line with what things that we were sharing that to not neglect the practical at the, in the pursuit of the mystical. Yeah. Um, and I guess what, where that's coming from is like, I, I do, I do feel myself like, having a really big spiritual calling, spiritual inclination, nature, pursuit. And what I've struggled with is having enough of a, I guess, material or practical foundation that gives me freedom, actual freedom in like the expression of that, my kind of spiritual gifts or mystical gifts. And, um, and what that looks like, it, you know, could be different for everyone. But like, I, I didn't live in a, in my own home. Like I changed homes every six months for like, since I graduated from college, yeah. you know, there was, I, I, I experienced a lot of just sort of practical instability um, that I think, you know, some people can manage that. And, and I could manage that for a little while. And I think I have had kind of a romanticized view of like the wandering sadhu or, you know, the um, kind of the mystics of old or whatever. And I am coming into more of a, and yeah, I think some people may be able to, that may be part of their calling. I think I'm coming more into like, what does, what like kind of the gift of stability the a lot of the monastic traditions hold that as a one of their vows or values like yeah. stability um which for me what i'm living into that now is just more, in more of the practical places like um being grounded in place um being grounded in my relationships um having a a a consistent income like that is has been so not the thing that I pursued right um because I was really engaged in my spiritual path so I don't know if that's like too (laughs) no I think it's really profound just because there are actual actions or things that feel a little more on the mundane side of the spectrum that we can anchor into or focus into that doesn't make the journey any less spiritual. And it it is, there is such a value in that where I think our, like we were talking about our inclination sometimes is to chase that mystical experience or that elusive feeling of the spirit world or the energy or the other side or whatever it is. But really there there's, I mean, it's profound. There's so much value in um, the day to day, you know, and what we can create there. I'll just add one more thing, yeah, maybe, which is sort of related. I think the thing, I mean, I don't know if it would make a difference for me having heard it before or if it makes a difference for people. But as I've been preparing priestess school, I've gone through these periods where I'm like, I don't think I would recommend this path. <laughs> like, I don't think I can in good faith be like, come do this thing because there's a cost, you know, and yeah. you, you know this too, like there it doesn't come at no cost. And, um, and you can't know what that's going to be before you do it. So yeah, again, maybe the warning wouldn't work, but, um, it truly is not for the faint of heart. Um, there's no guarantees. Um, and probably the, this is something I, again, have to keep relearning. Like the thing you think you're going to get, it may be motivating early on and yeah. you need those motivations. Like I need a carrot sometimes, 
um, but the ma the maturation of like that spiritual path is gonna have is gonna require finding that there's no carrot. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, and it might like you were kind of saying it might it might end up looking totally different than what you thought you know what we thought we were chasing after. It yeah. might it, it often I mean I found it just in talking to a lot of people it often it is very different in life than what we thought. At the beginning, yes. it was that we were signing up for. I guess. Yes. <laughs> I mean, say. life is like that. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of your wisdom and your light with us. I appreciate your time and being here, and we are excited to see what you continue you. to share with the world. Again, I'm going to link all of Kate's uh, contact points and social media at names and all of that so you can find her connect with her don't sleep on that free gift guys because i'm not <laughs> going you. to thanks for being here <laughs> thanks you today. so much joy <laughs> what a great conversation with a beautiful soul certainly a spiritual luminary of our time um i wasn't kidding when I was saying that I'm going to get on that free gift. Her, um, It's called Earth Magic, Three Simple Celebrations of Spiritual Nourishment. I'm going to put the link for that in the show notes as well. It's katefontana.com slash earth dash magic. Um, but like I said, don't worry about memorizing it. I'll put it in the show notes. I really love when we can take advantage of these free mini courses. I think there's so much to learn and glean. I'm curious to know how you experienced this conversation, if it was thought provoking for you. Uh, I know so many of us have either experiences with religious backgrounds or families with religious backgrounds, uh, and certainly it affects us in a cultural way, in a personal way, and just finding our own rhythm with it. I also really love what she was saying about the peaks and valleys or the expansion and contraction. Um, that was really profound. I actually want some more time to, to sit with that and to think about that. It's something that I think a lot about in my own personal work, just because it is that ebb and flow, right? We None of us are exempt from the highs and lows, the, the successes and challenges of life and the spectrum of emotions like we talk about pretty frequently here. So I, I really just think there's a, a lot of profound, delicious tidbits and, and we could have gone deep into so many different areas. I feel like these conversations go so fast. Um, so let me know how this resonated with you. Let me know if you check out Kate's uh, free program, um, the Earth Magic program. Let me know how you like it. I am going to check it out myself, like I said. Uh, and again, if you are liking these, episodes, be sure to subscribe and share. And if there are topics that you're wanting to hear about or curious about, I do know or have access to a lot of other spiritual practitioners who are gifted in their own ways, just like Kate. Um, and I'm more than, more than excited to share all of them. As you know, I, I always have questions. <laughs> There's always more for us to learn. So I really love sharing these conversations with you. So if you want to suggest topics or if you want to share feedback, you definitely can do it in the review section of wherever you're watching this, whether it's the comments or um, the feedback section. Uh, but you can also email admin at joyfulmedium.com. And remember, uh, I also have a free three-day mini course sign magnet for those wanting to get signs in the world uh, from the universe to answer questions or just to check in about something that you're pondering or, or deciding about, um, how to use numbers as signs for seeing recurring numbers, whether you are or whether you'd like to. It uh, this course shares all the meanings of those numbers. And also, since I'm a medium, I couldn't leave out the spirit world, how to get a specific sign from loved ones in the spirit world. So that course is available on the homepage of my website, joyfulmedium.com. Uh, it's called Sign Magnet. It's also a three-day mini course. And I will also link that in the show notes. So you guys will have a basket full of free tools and things to play with uh, this week. Big hugs, lots of love. Thanks for joining me today, as always, from inside the Spirit Speakeasy.